first of all, I th actually, I'd like to very much to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank Sheila for her sterling efforts in getting us somewhere. And I'd obviously like to thank very much indeed our hosts. It's very, it's very heartwarming and encouraging that although Leeds Council couldn't find a space for us, wouldn't find a space for us, uh, this Islamic community here gave us this land to, to, to talk to you on. And I'm really very appreciative of that, as I think all of us are. They are, they are sending a very clear message about the value of freedom of speech, the importance of it, and I think they're also sending out a very clear sense that of a moral perspective, and that's, that's what I, I'm going to be talking about today, a kind of moral perspective on, on what this is all about. I don't have the details. I've never been to Syria. I haven't been to a war zone. I can't speak about the kind of things that Vanessa will be speaking about, and I haven't done the kind of professional inquiry that Piers done or the detailed forensic analysis that, that Robert's done. But what, what I've done is reflect a little bit about our role and our relationship with the media. And I've even tried to put myself in the place of some of the people in the media. Not the ones that have... I don't, I'm not going to try and figure out how they get in with ISIS and that kind of thing. I've been thinking how it is to be a moral human being and put out stuff that actually you know isn't true. Now, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say that every person in the media is saying things they know not to be true, but some of them are. And that, I think, can be established without you know, too much discussion. Now, we, we don't look to the media to provide us with moral education. That's not their role. Um, but we don't look to them to undermine the moral education that we might want to give our children or to undermine the moral fabric of society. And we certainly don't expect them to be encouraging immoral behaviour. And above all, we don't expect them to be enticing people into a kind of conduct that could lead them into harm, to causing harm, of which they're not even aware. The media should at least be giving appropriate information about the world. Now... I think it should go without saying that we expect the media to abide by the law. Um, not just the letter of the law, but hopefully also the spirit of the law. But that might be hoping a little bit too much. Um, but I, I would emphasise that I am not a lawyer. And I'd also emphasise that this afternoon I'm not here speaking as an academic. I was introduced as a professor because that's, that's my day job. And that gives me certain aptitudes, well, it reflects certain aptitudes and interests. I'm here as, as, as a citizen. I'm here as a parent. I'm here as someone who would like there to be a decent world for my children to go out into and to grow up in. That's why I'm here. Others on the platform can reveal the kind of terrible cruelty and violence that others are capable of. But I've never been to a war zone, as I said. So I'm thinking about it purely from the point of view of the information that comes into our society, into our sitting rooms, onto our TV, into our screen, and also into the heads of our, not only ourselves, but also our children. The blogs that I've been doing on Syria have been thinking about whose words you can rely on. And the list of media outlets in recent years that I think you can rely on at all has diminished to close to nothing. One of the last remaining ones for me was Channel 4, who I did think were a relatively credible organisation. And so that's why I've kind of focused particularly on their output, because the people that you expect most from, you can also get the most disappointed by. And I spoke about them at the first media on trial uh, last June. Um, and what I've done today is pick out a few clips of their output um, and then to offer some reflection on them because they very much go to the theme that, I, that I'm talking about this afternoon. So I'm going to play um, the first clip, I think. It's Sorry, I, I wasn't doing the slides at the same time as I was talking. Um, I'm trying to get too many things in, too, in my hands here. This slide... Now, now, should be the clip. No. Okay. Um, 
Do we press the button to make, make the, the video go back? We, di we didn't have a technical rehearsal because we, we, we were setting up um, right up to the last minute. Now, uh, we have tonight an exclusive report on how British women have started signing up for jihad in Syria. She's a poster girl for the jihad. This young British woman has traded life in London for a supporting role in the war in Syria. But now she's 2,000 miles away, committed to someone else's civil war. She loses no opportunity to call for other Muslims to follow. These are your brothers and sisters as well, and they need our help. You know, so instead of sitting down, focusing on your families or focusing on your studies, we need to stop being selfish because, you know, subhanAllah, the time is ticking. While their men fight, the two women and their children go shopping. And they're taking their Kalashnikovs just in case. I think children uh, adapt very quickly, so she's been okay. First few days, you know, she was saying she wants to go back home, she wants to go to England, but um, now she's okay, alhamdulillah. I think she loves it, you know, she loves being outdoors and being able to just just play, really. I, she's okay now. My Kalash is better than yours, from. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Then why? Because hmm? it got the hood stock. Mm -mm. Yes. Mine is smaller. Yeah, because that's for going to shops and this is for the fight. You yeah, know? but when I'm shooting my one, it's better than when I'm shooting your one. It feels more comfortable. That's what I really want to see. Uh, but alhamdulillah, I'm really happy that uh, she's pregnant and uh, inshallah it'll be a boy. <laughs> inshallah. Already looking to the next generation to take on the family jihad. When I first saw that, um, like taking some clips from a slightly longer one, but it was an item, I, I couldn't actually believe that Channel 4 put that out. I don't honestly know what one is supposed to make of that. Uh, pardon? It, it could be a lifestyle thing. It could be perhaps a holiday destination suggestion. Um, it's, it's, it's beyond words, but I also... Would, would point out that in, in the midst of that there's, an immoral, there's a moral appeal. There's a girl there who's saying about giving up your se selfish ways, giving up your family values. Now I'm thinking there are plenty of people who bring up their children to think that moral duty is important, that helping your friends is important, not being selfish is important. Yeah, they would also say that doing your studies is important. But what, what's happening here is, is that girl is being quoted telling her peers come and join us because you have a kind of, of duty to do this. And there's no context given at all about this. No way of knowing that really it is the case that this girl needs to have better knowledge of the world. This girl needs to have better understanding of, of, of the religious claims that she, she's implying. But you're not getting that from Channel 4. Now... This in itself is an item which, you know, you even found that there's stuff to laugh in it about, and I think that's right. But it sh I think it shows something about the ethos in that newsroom that, that they put that out. Channel John, John Snow sat there and introduced it, and they thought it was appropriate to put it out. What were they thinking, is, is, is my question. Um, now... Channel 4 have got a statutory mission of public service broadcasting. In that respect, they're like the BBC. Last year, I spoke about their, their, their statutory obligation for accuracy and impartiality. Um, this year, the theme of Media on Trial is complicity in terrorism. Now, I've emphasised I'm not a lawyer. I'm not even speaking as an academic. So I'm just thinking about this as a moral question. What they didn't show at all in that clip, and, and this is not it's something they've also downplayed in all of their output, I think, is what's really going on. I mean, what really happens when people heed that call, think of their moral obligation, or perhaps think it's purely an adventure, or perhaps they just like the idea of going shopping with a Kalashnikov slung over their, 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 their shoulder. This is just... I, 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 I kind of feel lost for words. I mean, they're saying things like children adapt very quickly to the lifestyle there. Are Channel 4 really telling us what the life of a child is like if you go and live with, with the jihadists fighting 
on the ground in Syria. It's, it, it's, she loves being outdoors, we are told in that clip. I mean, girls are not out, uh, outdoors at their peril, and, and they're going to take on the family she had. You have, the, end, the clip ends with them talking about bring a child into this, a second child, because we saw one in the clip, and take on the family jihad. And they're doing this in that chirpy tone of voice, which I just find extraordinary. They don't tell you what the reality is going to be of, of, of women and girls and men who go and f- mi- mi- mix in with that. And there's the Channel 4 team. Now, it's not that the Channel 4 team are ignorant... They can't plead ignorance, even if they seem to be prepared to disseminate it. Alex Thompson, who actually I, I would give some credit to, because just recently he's been reporting from Duma and actually of, and of, of Guta, and, and telling, bearing out all the things that Vanessa has been saying for a long time, showing that that is actually the truth, that life there, in his word, the word he said he kept hearing was it's hell. That's what he said. Everybody said, it's hell there. You didn't get a sense that those, those, those girls were being invited to go out to hell by Channel 4. They were inverting the truth. But the truth was known by Channel 4 back in 2012 when Alex Thompson was set up. He, this is his own view. He was set up for a false flag operation. He's not being a conspiracy crank talking about false flags because he was there. His skin was in the game and he came out of it by the skin of his teeth. And he said, I am quite clear the rebels deliberately set us up to be shot by the Syrian army. Because dead journos, it's bad for Damascus. Makes them look bad. He was quite aware that these people are capable of anything, including these false flag operations back then. He said, don't believe for one moment that his experience with the rebels was a one-off. He said, in a war where these so-called rebels slit the throats of toddlers back to the spine. What's the big deal in sending a van full of journalists into the killing zone? For them, it would be just part of a day's work. So the, the Channel 4 news team is perfectly well aware that their own journalists couldn't go safely into any of these areas. They know that the rebels so-called, from, uh, from very early in the war, they're not rebel, not moderate in any kind of practical sense that's going to make a difference if you want to put your foot on the ground there. So, I think we're, we're at the next clip, hopefully. This is um, called Up Close with the Rebels. This is the story of one small but famous victory as rebels fought back against the forces of Bashar al-Assad. It's early morning and they're planning an attack. This group is well equipped, paid for and supplied by Gulf states, mainly Qatar. In the midst of battle, there's always a camera. And a director. Moderates and extremists still shoulder to shoulder amid deepening sectarian hatred. So, a famous victory, we're told. Um, a famous victory, says Krishna Guru Murthy, of, of these rebels who we've been thinking about. I would say, I'm speaking here as, as someone thinking about the morality of this, not the legality, but that sounds very much to me like glorifying it. Um, and we should bear in mind the language of the Terrorism Act of 2006. Glorifying acts of terrorism, encouraging people to think that you are, is actually what it's trying to prevent happening. Now, I'm not saying that literally that's what they're doing, but it does sound like, court speaking of famous victories is glorifying them. They're planning an attack, we're told. And who, who, who's they? Well, this face here may be familiar to some of you. Um, here he is again. This is a group of fighters that he was with that we saw in, in that clip. 
And this is them again with Abdullah Issa, a young Palestinian boy, who shortly after this um, clip, uh, this uh, uh, frame of the clip, had his head removed by these people. It's severed. Um, so that's who they're up close with. Um, thank you. Okay, I better press on. Um, in the clip you heard that they're funded by Qatar, um, who are also the, 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 the owners of Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera is another channel on another occasion perhaps we'll talk about, but um, they were responsible for the information that came out of Syria in the early days of the war. Uh, they had the, the predominance of it came from them. And there's questions to be asked, and we, we, we would not be the first to be asking them. As you see, there's an event here of Al Jazeera on trial. Um, in the clip, we also saw, for one brief frame, a guy wearing the White Helmets logo, um, who seems to have been embedded with them. And we also were told that there's a camera and a director. The concatenation of, of fighters, White Helmets, cameras and directors seems to be a recurring theme, um, as Vanessa will we say more about perhaps. Uh, Channel 4 pulled that, what, that um, clip. It's, it's, you can still find it actually on, 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 on YouTube. But they haven't pulled this one, so I'm going to just play this as the last clip we have today. Now, just before we came on air, I spoke to Faraz Shahabi, a pro-regime MP for Aleppo. I asked him how many civilians are now at risk in East Aleppo. They do not wish to live under... Mr. Assad, they do not wish to live under your regime. They wish to be free. Look, this, we are not a re banana republic. This is a legitimate government. We, it is not about Assad and, and the regime. This is a legitimate government fighting international terrorism. Mr. Shahabi, I'm sorry, but there is no government on earth at this moment that has killed as many of its own people as yours has. Your own constituents, your own friends, you claim, they have been killed by the government. Flying planes, dropping barrel bombs. You are the MP for Aleppo. Your yeah. own constituents are dying from your own air force and you don't do anything about it. You don't this seem is, to care a damn about your this, own this constituents. Is absolutely, this, is, this is absolutely false. My own civilians were, were being uh, taken uh, hostage in the largest hostage-taking situation in the world by terrorists on the UN terrorist list. And if we that have is to the case, them. Mr. Shahabi, why do you bomb the hospitals in which your own constituents, your own civilians are seeking aid to help them repair the wounds that your airport, Air Force really? has inflicted? If they really care about hospitals, why would they turn state-owned hospitals into command centers for Al-Qaeda? This is, this is a picture of um, Aleppo in, in 2012, and it gives a sense of the environment that the rebels had brought to the town. Um, it's what's being ignored, to put it charitably, by the media. Whitewashed is another word that you might use. Inverting the truth is even possibly another thing you, you might say. So my, I, I've, I've picked out some clips from Channel 4 because I want to give examples, but the media in its entirety has had an most incredible, as Piers was talking about before, incredible lockdown on information. So that it's, it's, you know, a black has been white and white has been black across the piece. And it's, it's truly, it's truly troubling. I mean... My, my, my point isn't that to make legalistic allegations. What we're talking about here is the most rudimentary journalistic integrity. We're talking about common human decency. And I find it very difficult as a human being to imagine how you could go out to work and actually be maintaining this kind of untruth, this kind of dishonesty, this kind of, frankly, immorality as, as you're living. I find that very difficult. And I think if the public were more aware, they would also find it difficult. and They too would be asking more questions. I said at the beginning, I'm the naive one. But I think 
being the naive one, I'm also probably speaking for a lot of people, not those in this room, but out there who still trust the media. I've come to this losing trust at a, a rapid rate, and this has give, given you the kind of indication of why that is. As for Faris Shahabi, who's being berated so incredibly there by Jon Snow, this is him more recently. And in this picture, you, you might see some people you recognise. Certainly there's one you should recognise. This, these are people who are conveying what's actually happening, what's actually happening on the ground. This is real. I can tell you a, a person who's there, with Faris, who's there, in a place that they're talking about. We are able now to know what's really going on. It's not what Channel 4 has been telling us with those clips. So, while feeling terribly dismayed, worried, concerned, there's also a, a glimmer of hope that is represented, I think, by the people in this room, especially by the people who have been out there and made this possible for, to see it, that the truth will come through. And that's why I had my kind of... The, the photo that I finished and ended with is, is Vanessa's friend, Eva Bartlett, who's there in Aleppo, which she said the journalists couldn't... Did, had nobody on the ground there at the end of 2016 in the eastern part. There she is now looking at that city and seeing that, that peace did come to at least there. But the war's not over in Syria and there's still misleading going on. And we need to be aware of this and we need, I think as a public, to be saying we're just not going to accept it anymore. I think we are deserting the mainstream media and I think we need also to be supporting those that are doing the, the truthful journalism. Thank you.